Today we're going to be looking at another one of Veritasium's videos. Specifically, why it is almost impossible to make the blue LED. Well, nuclear engineering is no stranger to blue glowy things. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this out. LEDs don't get their color from their plastic covers. And you can see that because here is a transparent LED that also glows the same red color. The color of the light comes from the electronics themselves. The casing just helps us tell different LEDs apart. Mm -hmm. In 1962, General Electric engineer Nick Holignac created the first visible LED. It glowed a faint red. Did not realize LEDs were that old. That's cool. A few years after that, engineers at Monsanto created a green LED. But for decades, all we had were those two colors. So LEDs could only be used in things like indicators, calculators, and watches. Well, red and green's pretty important. I mean, red meaning stop and green meaning go. Though what's interesting is in nuclear power plants, it's arguably the other way around, at least at the plant that I worked. Red means something is in the active position, and green generally means something is in the deactivated position. So for instance, for a valve position indication, red means the valve's open, green means the valve's closed. If both lights are lit, then that means the valve is somewhere in mid position. Same is true for electrical components. Red meaning the breaker is on or energized, and green meaning the breaker is off or de-energized. If only we could make blue, then we could mix red, green, and blue to make white and every other color, unlocking LEDs for every type of lighting in the world. Can't make much of a color spectrum with just red and green. If I were to take a guess why blue would be harder, it would be it has a shorter wavelength. I mean, after all, the color of light is just a form of radiation, specifically in electromagnetic radiation, and blue just has a shorter wavelength. And shorter energy wavelengths require a large energy band gap in semiconductors. So, okay, I can see where this is going. From light bulbs to phones to computers to TVs to billboards. But blue was almost impossible to make. Throughout the 1960s, Every big electronics company in the world, from IBM to GE to Bell Labs, raced to create the blue LED. They knew it would be worth billions. Despite yeah. the efforts of thousands of researchers, nothing worked. Ten years after Holignac's original LED turned into 20, then 30, and the hope of ever using LEDs for light faded away. According to a director at Monsanto, these won't ever replace the kitchen light. They'd only be used in appliances, car dashboards, and stereo sets and we to use them see everywhere. if the stereo was on. This might still be true today, if not for one engineer who defied the entire industry and made three radical breakthroughs to create the world's first blue LED. Wow. Okay, I did not know about this origin story. All right. I'm, I'm hooked now. These sort of brand or product origin stories are probably one of my favorite genre of movies. Uh, my wife and I love watching these. <laughs> Shuji Nakamura was a researcher at a small Japanese chemical company named Nishia. They had recently expanded into the production of semiconductors to be used in the manufacture of red and green LEDs. But by the late 1980s, the semiconductor division was on its last legs. They were competing against far more established companies in a crowded market, and they were losing. Tensions started to run high. Younger employees begged Nakamura to create new products, while senior workers called his research a waste of money. Hmm. And at Nishia, money was in short supply. Nakamura's lab mainly consisted of machinery he had scavenged and welded together himself. Phosphorus leaks in his lab created so many explosions Ooh. that his co-workers had stopped checking in on him. By 1988, Nakamura's supervisor... You know your company's not doing well when they're not checking in on basic lab safety procedures. That's not a good position you want to be in. ...were so disillusioned with his research that they told him to quit. So it was out of desperation that he brought a radical proposal to the company's founder and president, Nobuo Ogawa. The elusive blue LED that the likes of Sony, Toshiba, and Panasonic had all failed at. 
What if Nishia could be the one to create it? This is starting to sound like the journey towards nuclear fusion. Yes, they mentioned the 60s and now it's the 80s, so it's already been a few decades at this point. But I'm glad the blue LED took off. It could arguably be, be just as gr groundbreaking, that is, when fusion eventually does happen. After suffering loss after loss on their semiconductors for more than a decade, Ogawa took a gamble. He devoted 500 million yen, or $3 million, likely around 15% of the company's annual profit, wow. to Nakamura's Moonshot project. Everyone knew that LEDs had the potential to replace light bulbs, because light bulbs, the universal symbol for a bright idea, are actually terrible at making light. They work by running current through a tungsten filament, which gets so hot it glows. But most of the electromagnetic radiation bulbs. comes out as infrared heat. Only a negligible fraction is visible light. In contrast, LED stands for light emitting diode. It's right there in the name. <laughs> LEDs primarily create light, so they're far more efficient. And a diode is just a device with two electrodes, which only allows current to flow in one direction. This reminds me of when, at least when LEDs were first replacing um, incandescent bulbs for use in the house. And this might be just an American thing, it probably is but they put in how many watts people were used to getting from an incandescent bulb, even though LEDs use a fraction of the power. So if someone went in looking for a 60 watt bulb incandescent, they didn't say lumens, the actual unit of brightness, which is what the consumer cared about, people equated power to brightness. Well, for an LED, you can get the same amount of lumens as a 60 watt incandescent for something like nine or 10 watts. So trying to explain that to a consumer, it's like, why do I only need nine watts is a bit of a challenge. So they said watt equivalent, which is pretty funny. I think some of them still say that. So here's how an LED works. When you have an isolated atom, each electron in that atom occupies a discrete energy level. You can think of these energy levels Quantum like state. individual seats from a hockey stadium. And all atoms of the same element, when they are far apart from each other, have identical available energy levels. But when you bring multiple atoms together to form a solid, something interesting happens. The outermost electrons now feel the pull not only of their own nucleus, but of all the other nuclei as well. Mm -hmm. And as a result, their energy levels shift. So instead of being identical... Notice he's saying the entire atoms at this point. The nuclei are not that relatively close. We're not talking about nuclear reactions here. <laughs> they become a series of closely spaced but separate energy levels, an energy band. The highest energy band with electrons in it is known as the valence band. Mm -hmm. And the next higher energy band is called the conduction band. You can think of it like the balcony level. In conductors, the valence band is only partially filled. This means with a little bit of thermal energy, electrons can jump into nearby unfilled seats. And if an electric field is applied, they can jump from one unfilled seat to the next and conduct current through the material. In insulators, the valence band is full and the difference in energy between the valence and conduction well. bands, the band gap, is large. So when an electric field is applied, no electrons can move. There are no available seats to move into in the valence band, and the band gap is too big for any electrons to jump into the conduction band. Which brings us to semiconductors. Semiconductors are similar to insulators, except the band gap is much smaller. This means at room temperature, a few electrons will have sufficient energy to jump into the conduction band. And now they can easily access nearby empty seats and conduct current. Not only that, the empty seats they left behind in the valence band can also move. This is such well, a great really, analogy. It's the nearby electrons jumping into those empty seats, but if you look from afar, it's as though the empty seat or hole is moving, like a positive charge in the opposite direction to the electrons in the conduction band. By themselves, this is always one concept to me that's been a little weird. Now, I'm not an electronics engineer, so I probably don't quite think like one. But when I think of current flow, I think of electrons moving. Negative charge, 
flowing to positive. Though on electrical drawings, it shows the conventional current flowing from positive to negative, tracking the holes or absences of electrons. But the way he explained it was so good, just showing at the junction the movement of electrons and the holes. I really appreciate that. Themselves, pure semiconductors are not that useful. To make them way more functional, you have to add impurity atoms into the lattice. Right. This is known as doping. For example, in silicon, you can add a small number of phosphorus atoms. Phosphorus is similar to silicon, so it easily fits into the lattice, but it brings with it one extra valence electron. This electron exists in a donor level just beneath the conduction band. So with a bit of thermal energy, all these electrons can jump into the conduction band and conduct current. Since most of the charges that can move in this type of semiconductor are electrons, which are negative, this sort of semiconductor is N -type. called N-type, N for negative. But I should point out that the semiconductor itself is still neutral. It's just that most of the mobile charge carriers are negative, they're electrons. So there is also another type of semiconductor where most of the mobile charge carriers are positive, and it's called P-type. To make P-type silicon, you add a small number of atoms of, say, boron. Boron fits into the lattice, but brings with it one fewer valence electron than silicon. So it creates an empty acceptor level just above the valence band. And with a bit of thermal energy, electrons can jump out of the valence band, leaving behind holes. It is these positive holes which are mostly responsible so for carrying current <laughs> in the P-type semiconductor. Man, I really wish I had him to explain this to me when I was taking my electrical and instrumentation classes that were prereqs for some of the more advanced nuclear engineering classes when I was in college. This would have helped out quite a bit. Also, he mentioned boron. For what it's worth, boron is a key active ingredient in slowing down a fission reaction in a nuclear power plant. It's often used in control rods or injected into the reactor as boric acid. And that's because boron nuclei are way more attractive to free neutrons than uranium or even plutonium for that matter. But they don't fission, they just sh shut down the reaction. Granted, that occurs at much closer ranges than this. We're talking about valence electrons. The neutrons are interacting with the boron nuclei themselves. They more or less ignore all this stuff. Again, the material overall is uncharged. It's just that most of the mobile charge carriers are positive holes. Where things get interesting is when you put a piece of P-type and N-type together. Junction, yeah. Without even connecting this to a circuit, some electrons will diffuse from N to P and fall into the holes in the P-type. This makes the P-type a little negatively charged and the N-type a little positively charged. Recombination. So there is now an electric field inside an inert piece of material. Electrons keep diffusing until the electric field becomes so large it prevents them from crossing over. And now we have established the depletion region, an area depleted of mobile charge carriers. There are no electrons in the conduction band and no holes in the valence band. If you connect a battery the wrong way to this diode, it simply expands the depletion region until its electric field perfectly mm -hmm. opposes that of the battery and no current flows. But if you flip the polarity of the battery, then the depletion region shrinks, the electric field decreases, and electrons can flow from N to P. When an electron falls from the conduction band into a hole in the valence band, that band gap energy can be emitted as a photon. The energy change of the electron is emitted as light. And this is how a light emitting diode works. The size of the band gap determines the color of the light emitted. In pure silicon, the band gap is only 1.1 electron volts, so the photon released isn't visible, it's infrared light. Yes. These LEDs are actually used in remote controls like for your TV, and you can capture them. On One other way of looking at LEDs is a solar panel that runs backwards, because in a solar panel, you're absorbing photons from the sun. It excites the electrons on the band gap, which creates current. This uses the photoelectric effect. That's how solar makes electricity, basically. Now, if the light was much more energetic than visible sunlight, say x-rays or gamma rays, 
then it's not just the valence shell that it will eject. It can eject the innermost electrons, depending on how energetic this light is. Veritasium just mentioned about the electron volt. X-rays, we're talking several hundred thousand electron volts, and gamma rays can get into the million. And in the millions of electron volts, they can cause a lot more fun ionization events than the mere photoelectric effect. On camera, Moving up the spectrum, you can see why the first visible light LEDs were red, and then green, and why blue was so hard. A photon of blue There's light more requires energy. more energy and therefore a larger band gap. By the 1980s, after hundreds of millions of dollars had been spent hunting for the right material, every electronics company had come up empty-handed. But researchers had at least figured out the first critical requirement, high-quality crystal. No matter what material you used for the blue LED, it required a near-perfect crystal structure. Any defects in the crystal lattice disrupt the flow of electrons. So instead of emitting their energy as visible light, it is instead dissipated as heat. This is the same reason why gamma ray detectors, if you want to fully analyze the radioisotope, not just hear a click on your Geiger counter, for instance, but if you want to look at the full spectrum, you need something that's high purity, like high purity germanium, for instance. So the first step in Nakamura's proposal to Agawa was to disappear to Florida. He knew an old colleague there whose lab was beginning to use a new crystal making technology called metal organic chemical vapor deposition, or MOCVD. An MOCVD reactor, essentially a giant oven, was yeah, and like. still is the best way to mass produce clean crystal. It works by injecting vapor molecules of your crystal into a hot chamber, where they react with a base material called a substrate to form layers. It's important that the substrate lattice matches the crystal lattice being built on top of it to create a stable, smooth crystal. This is a precise art. The crystal layers often need to be as thin as just a couple of atoms. Nakamura oh, joined cool. the lab for a year to Actual master atoms. MOCVD, but his time there was miserable. He wasn't allowed to use the working MOCVD, so he spent 10 of his 12 months assembling a new system almost from scratch. Hmm. Even worse, his Corporate lab policy. mates shunned him because Nakamura didn't have a doctorate, nor any academic papers to his name, as Nishia didn't allow publishing. That is horrible. Some of the smartest people that I've worked with didn't even have engineering degrees, but what they did have was curiosity, passion, intelligence, and simply the drive to do a good job. That's all that matters. I'm not saying don't get an engineering degree, I'm just saying don't look down on people that don't have one. His lab mates, all PhD researchers, dismissed him as a lowly technician. This experience fueled Technicians him. Can be smart. Nakamura wrote, I feel resentful when people look down on me. I developed more fighting spirit. I would not allow myself to be beaten by such people. Especially 1980s Japanese corporate culture, very subservient to your superiors. Nowadays, I even shun at calling them superiors, but higher up individuals on the org chart, this took courage. He returned to Japan in 1989 with two things in hand. One, an order for a brand new MOCVD reactor for Nishia, and two, a fervent desire to get his PhD. At that time in you Japan, go, you could earn a PhD without having to go to university, simply by publishing five papers. <laughs> Nakamura had always known his chances of inventing the blue LED were low, but now he had a backup plan. Even if he didn't succeed, he could at least get his PhD. But now the question was, with MOCVD under his belt, which material should he research? By this time, scientists had narrowed the options down to two main candidates, zinc selenide and gallium nitride. Mm. These were both semiconductors with band gaps theoretically in the blue light range. Zinc selenide was the far more promising option. When grown in an MOCVD reactor, it had only a 0.3% lattice mismatch with its substrate, gallium arsenide. Therefore, zinc selenide crystal had about a thousand defects per square centimeter, within the upper limit for LED functioning. Its only issue was that while scientists had figured out multiple different ways to create N-type zinc selenide, no one knew how to create P-type. Mm, okay. In contrast, gallium nitride had been abandoned by almost everybody for three reasons. First, it was much harder to make a high-quality crystal. 
The best substrate for growing gallium nitride was sapphire, but its lattice mismatch was 16%. This resulted in higher defects, over 10 billion per square centimeter. That's the second lot. problem was that, like zinc selenide, scientists had only ever created N-type gallium nitride using silicon. P-type was elusive. And third, to be commercially viable, a blue LED would have to have a total light output power of at least a thousand microwatts. This really is all sounding like the quest for fusion. Hard thing, theoretical hard thing, plus the requirement for it to be commercially viable. It even has three steps. Those three steps for fusion are high temperature, high pressure, and confinement time. Even here, looking at this gallium nitride material struggles, I'm just thinking of the material struggles that were needed to withstand extreme heat and neutron bombardment in a fusion reactor. That's two orders of magnitude more than any prototype had ever achieved. So between the two candidates, almost all researchers were focused on zinc selenide. Nakamura surveyed the crowded field and decided that if he were going to publish five papers by himself, he'd better focus on gallium nitride, where the competition was much less fierce. And of course, this that's material's the one that's main claim to fame life. was one <laughs> development back in 1972 when RCA engineer Herbert Maruska made a tiny gallium nitride blue LED but it was dim and inefficient, so RCA slashed the project's budget, calling it a dead end. 20 years later, scientific opinion hadn't changed. When Nakamura attended the biggest applied physics conference in Japan, the talks on zinc selenide had over 500 attendees. The talks on gallium nitride had five. The unpopular one. Two of those five attendees were the world experts on I wonder if that means stellarators are gonna beat Tokamax because they're less popular. Probably not. Gallium nitride, Dr. Isumu Akazaki and his former grad student, Dr. Hiroshi Amano. In contrast to Nakamura's academic background, they were researchers at Nagoya University, one of Japan's best. A few years earlier, they had made a breakthrough on the first problem of high quality crystal. Instead of growing gallium nitride directly on sapphire, they first grew a buffer layer of aluminum nitride. This has a lattice spacing in between that of the other two materials, okay. making Bridge it easier gap. to grow a clean gallium nitride crystal on top. The only issue was that the aluminum caused problems for the MOCVD reactor, making the process hard to scale. Mm. But Nakamura wasn't even close at this stage. Back at Nishia, he couldn't get gallium nitride to even grow normally in his new MOCVD reactor. After six months, desperate for results, he decided to take the machine apart and build a better version himself. His 10 months spent putting together the reactor in Florida were suddenly invaluable. He began following the same routine each day, arrive at the lab at 7 a.m., spend the first half of the day welding, cutting, and rewiring the reactor, spend the rest of the day experimenting with the modified reactor to see what it can do. At 7 p.m., go home, eat dinner, wash, and sleep. 12-hour days. Sounds about right for something like this. Nakamura repeated this routine every single day, Ooh, through the weekends. taking no weekends and no holidays Brutal. except for New Year's Day, the most important holiday in Japan. Wow. After That's a dedication. year and a half of continuous work, he came into the lab on a winter day in late 1990. As usual, he tinkered around in the morning, grew a gallium nitride sample in the afternoon, and tested it. But this time, the electron mobility was four times higher basically Japanese Edison at this point than any gallium nitride ever grown directly on sapphire. Nakamura called it the most exciting day of his life. I bet that felt good. His trick was to add a second nozzle to the MOCVD reactor. The gallium nitride reactant gases had been rising in the hot chamber, mixing in the air to form a powdery waste. But the second nozzle released a downward stream of inert gas, pinning the first flow mm, to the substrate okay. to form a uniform crystal. For years, scientists had avoided adding a second stream to MOCVD because they thought it would only introduce more turbulence. But Nakamura used a special nozzle so that even when the streams combined, they remained laminar. 
He called his invention the two-flow reactor. Okay, I can see why it took so long to tinker with and calibrate to get it just right and just laminar. Laminar flow can get quite tricky when you're crossing streams like this. Laminar flow is very important to sterilize and separate. It's in our blood, literally. Blood flow is laminar. Now he was ready to take on Akazaki and Amano. But instead of copying their aluminum nitride buffer layer, his two-flow design allowed him to make gallium nitride so smooth and stable, it itself could be used as a buffer layer on the sapphire substrate. This, in turn, Solve yielded an even cleaner crystal of gallium nitride on top, without the issues of aluminum. Nakamura now had the highest quality gallium nitride crystals ever made. But just as he was getting started, things took a wrong turn. Maybe I need a passionate technician without a PhD in fusion, maybe. While he had been in Florida, Nobuo Ogawa had stepped back from Nishia to become chairman. In his day, Nobuo had been a risk-taking scientist, designing the company's first products. It's why he supported Nakamura's lofty plans all this time. But in his place, his son-in-law, Eiji Ogawa, became CEO of the company. Mm. And the younger Ogawa had a much stricter outlook. One Nishia client said, he has a mind of steel and he remembers everything. In 1990, an executive at Matsushita, an LED manufacturer, Admirable quality in certain walks of life, but in extreme Hail Mary innovation, I don't know and Nishia's biggest customer, visited the company to give a talk on blue LEDs. In it, he claimed zinc selenide was the way forward, declaring gallium nitride has no future. That very same day, Nakamura received a note from a- Does he know the full technical details and ramifications, and did he even know that he made the best gallium nitride ever? Stop work on gallium nitride immediately. Uh. Eiji Soul had never crushing. supported the research and wanted to end what he saw as a colossal waste. But Nakamura crumpled up the note and threw it away. Well played. And he did so again and again. Please tell me he doesn't get fired. When a succession of similar notes and phone calls came from company <laughs> management. Out of spite, he published his work on the two-flow reactor without Nishia's knowledge. It was his first paper. Awesome. One down, four to go. <laughs> With crystal formation settled, he turned to the second obstacle, creating P-type gallium nitride. Here, Akazaki and Amano had again beaten him to the punch. They had created a gallium nitride sample doped with magnesium, but at first it didn't perform as a P-type as they expected. However, after exposing it to an electron beam, it did behave as a P-type, the world's first P-type gallium nitride after 20 years of trying. Wow. The catch? was that no one knew why it worked, and the process of irradiating each crystal with electrons was too slow for commercial production. At f when I think of electron irradiation, I mainly just think of sterilizers. After all, it's just a bunch of beta particles, right? First, Nakamura copied Akazaki and Amano's approach, but he suspected the beam of electrons was overkill. Maybe all the crystal needed was energy. So he tried heating magnesium-doped gallium nitride to 400 degrees Celsius in a process known as annealing. It's a different way the to result, get energy. A completely P-type sample. That's interesting. I mainly think of annealing with steel, and the purpose is just to make it easier to work with. More ductile, less hard, less fragile. This worked even better than the shallow electron beam, which only made the surfaces of the samples P-type. And simply heating things up was a that's true. Yeah, you would have to you would have to take your electron beam and completely surround it if you want to get each and every side because beta particles are not very penetrative. Most of them will be stopped by your credit card unless you accelerate them, but that's way more expensive than annealing. Quick, scalable process. His work also revealed why the P-type had been so difficult. To make gallium nitride with MOCVD, you supply the nitrogen from ammonia, but ammonia also contains hydrogen. Where there should have been holes in the magnesium-doped gallium nitride, these hydrogen atoms were sneaking in and bonding with the magnesium, plugging all the holes. Adding energy to the system released the hydrogen from the material, freeing up the holes again. By now, Nakamura had all the ingredients to make a prototype blue LED. 
and he presented it at a workshop in St. Louis in 1992 nice. and received a standing ovation. He was beginning to make a name for himself. But even though he had created the best prototype to date, it was more of a blue-violet color and still mm. extremely inefficient. Violet's even higher energy. <laughs> but I get it. It's probably due to instability. With a light output power of just 42 microwatts, well below the 1,000 microwatt threshold for practical use. At Nishia, the new CEO's patience had run out. Eiji sent written orders to Nakamura to stop tinkering and turn whatever he had into a product. His job was on the line. But in Nakamura's own words, I kept ignoring his order. I had been successful because I didn't listen to company orders and trusted my own judgment. That's awesome. At this point, Could get he you only fired, had the third but... hurdle left. <laughs> yeah. Getting his blue LED to a light output power of a thousand microwatts. A known trick to increase the efficiency of LEDs was to create a well, a thin layer of material at the PN junction called an active layer that shrinks the band gap just a bit. This encourages more electrons to fall from the n-type conduction band into holes in the mm -hmm, p-type yes. valence band. The best active layer for more dope gallium nitride was already known to be indium gallium nitride, which would not only make the band gap easier to cross, but also narrow it just the right amount to bring its blue-violet gap down to true blue. This true time, blue. Akasaki and Amano didn't scoop Nakamura. They were stuck trying to grow indium gallium nitride in the first place. Amano recalled, it was generally said that gallium nitride and indium nitride would not mix, like water and oil. Mm. But Nakamura had an advantage, his ability to customize his MOCVD reactor. This allowed him to use brute force adjusting the reactor to pump as much indium as he could onto the gallium nitride Sometimes in that the works. hopes that That's at least awesome. some would stick. To his surprise, the technique worked, giving him a clean indium gallium nitride crystal. He quickly incorporated this active layer into his LED, but the well worked a little too well and overflowed with electrons, <laughs> leaking them back into the gallium nitride layers. Unfazed, within a few months, Nakamura had Let's fixed this back. too, by creating the opposite of a well, a hill. He returned to his reactor one more time to make aluminum gallium nitride, a compound with a larger band gap that could block electrons from escaping the well once inside. Oh, that's cool. Use both. The structure of the blue LED had become far more complex than anyone could have imagined. But it was complete. By 1992, Shuji Nakamura had this. Awesome. And, uh, I showed the chairman. I told him, please, hey, chairman, come to my you know, office. I showed the blue LED. And he said, oh, this is great, no? And he so hot. That's I think, awesome. I <laughs> to my office, yeah. yeah. After 30 years of searching by <laughs> countless scientists, Nakamura had done it he had created a glorious bright blue LED that could even be seen in daylight. It had a light output power of 1,500 microwatts and emitted a perfect blue at exactly 450 nanometers. Oh wow. It was over yeah, 100 right on the money. times brighter than the previous pseudo blue LEDs on the market. Nakamura wrote, I felt like I had reached the top of Mount Fuji. Nishia called a press conference in That's Tokyo amazing. to announce the world's first true blue LED. The electronics industry was stunned. A researcher from Toshiba remarked, everyone was caught with their pants down. <laughs> the effect on Nishia's fortunes was immediate and explosive. Orders flooded oh, in, imagine. and by the yes. end of 1994, they were manufacturing one million blue LEDs per month. Within three years, the company's revenue had nearly doubled. In 1996, they made the jump from blue to white, by placing a yellow phosphor over the LED. This chemical absorbs the blue photons and re-radiates them in a broad spectrum across the visible range. Soon enough, Nishio was- Just as simple as capping it, but you have to have the true blue for it to work. That's awesome. Selling the world's first white LED, at last unlocking the final frontier so many had doubted, LED lighting. Over the next four years, their sales doubled again. By 2001, their revenue was approaching $700 million a year. Over 60% came from blue, blue. LED products. <laughs> 
Today, Nishia is one of the largest LED manufacturers in the world, with an annual revenue in the billions. So many blankies. As for Nakamura, to whom Nishia owed the quadrupling of its fortunes, I increased my salary 60,000 after that average. I heard you only got a hundred and seventy dollar bonus. It's patent, what? patent, patent. So you got a hundred and seventy dollar bonus for the patent. Yes, yes. This was all while the blue LED was generating hundreds of millions of dollars in sales. Throw him a bone. Eiji Ogawa had always seen Nakamura's stubborn individuality as a liability, not a strength. The message was clear. In 2000, after more than 20 years at Nishia, Nakamura left the company for the U.S., where job offers had been pouring in. Oh, I'm sure. But his troubles with Nishia weren't over. He began consulting for Cree, another LED company. Nishia was furious and sued him for leaking company secrets. Wow. Nakamura responded by countersuing Nishia for never properly compensating him for his invention, <laughs> seeking $20 million. Yes. In 2001, the Japanese courts ruled with Nakamura and ordered Nishia to pay him 10 times his initial <laughs> request. But Nishia appealed, and the case was eventually settled with a payout of $8 million. Uh. In the end, this was only enough to cover Nakamura's legal fees. This is all he got for an invention that now comprises an $80 billion industry. From house lights to street lights. While you watch this video on a phone, that, computer, or TV, if you're outside following traffic lights or displays, chances are you are relying on blue LEDs. We might even be getting too much of them. You may have heard warnings to avoid blue light from screens before bed because it can disrupt <laughs> your circadian rhythm. This is a good time to talk about this. So it's not blue light. It isn't. We get way more blue light from the sun because blue is part of the sun's natural spectrum. After all, blue is 450 nanometers of light, plus or minus a range, but it's part of natural visible light spectrum. And everything you get from screens, way less compared to that of the sun, unless you live in a bunker and never see the sun or something. It's not dangerous radiation, though it is radiation, it's visible radiation. The real hazard is looking too much at a screen without breaks, not the blue light itself. The screens could be those old school orange plasma screens from the 1970s, it wouldn't matter. That all comes from the gallium nitride blue LED. But as for lighting, there are virtually no downsides to an LED bulb. Compared to an incandescent or fluorescent bulb, Less they energy. are far more efficient. They last many times longer, are safer to handle, and are completely customizable. 30 years after the first white LED, high-end bulbs today allow you to choose between 50,000 different shades of white. And blue. Most importantly, <laughs> their price has come down to only a couple of dollars more than other types of bulbs. And at their efficiency, with average daily use and electricity pricing, you can recoup that cost in only two months and continue to save for years after that. The result is a lighting revolution. In 2010, just 1% of residential lighting sales in the world were LED. In 2022, it was over half. Estimate that within the next 10 years, nearly all lighting sales will be all. LED. The energy savings will be enormous. Lighting accounts for 5% of all carbon emissions. A full switch to LEDs could save an estimated 1.4 billion tons of CO2, equivalent to taking almost half the cars in the world off the road. Plus the cars have lights on them too. <laughs> Today, Nakamura's research is on the next generation of LEDs, micro-LEDs and UV LEDs. There you go. So what are they making in there? Higher energy, even shorter wavelength for UV. Uh, LED is a power device. This is one of the best facility in the US. And this is because of you? <laughs> well, what's a standard LED size? 300 times 200 microns. Okay. Smallest is five microns. That is insanely tiny. Wow. So basically you can use that for like near eye display, such as AR and VR. You could have like a retina display that's like right up yeah. here. Yep. Human hair would be about that thick. Yep. And that's a really, really tiny LED. 
UV LEDs could be used That's to sterilize awesome. surfaces like in hospitals or kitchens. Just flick on the UV lights and pathogens would be dead in seconds. COVID-19, you know, you know, UV LED company, you know, stop pressing, it's kind of better because uh, everybody expects to use these uh, UV LEDs. We can sterilize all the COVID-19. Hopefully you know? he's done better well, anything they, uh, since working there. For UV, we use uh, aluminum gallium nitride. Okay. Because band gap is much bigger. And how UV stabilized is, is it just disrupts the DNA, RNA materials in microorganisms. And it's mainly UVC type, the 200 to 280 nanometer range, so you can't see it. And UVC is ionizing radiation. It's the weakest form of fully ionizing radiation compared to X-rays and gamma rays, but it is ionizing. Compared to UVA, which is the UV that tans you and ages you, and the UVB that risks getting your skin cancer. UVB is kind of in a weird spot. It's partially ionizing. Now UVC from the sun is generally stopped from the ozone layer, which is why we don't have to worry about it compared to UVA or UVB. I think this is what's coming. It's okay, it's work, but probably the cost, the cost is too high. Since sure. it's uh, less than 10%, the cost is very high. But uh, if the efficiency becomes more, more than 50%, the cost is uh, almost uh, comparable to the market now. And you think it will happen, right? Like the efficiency will go up. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It's yeah. just a matter of time. Yes, I think so. I have more confidence in this than I do in fusion, I'm sad to say. And he's even tackling one of the biggest challenges of our time. I need to study physics, so. Me too. I'm still interested in uh, nuclear fusion. So <laughs> he mentioned right fusion. The company of nuclear fusion. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. Last time. And I didn't see this coming. Yeah. No way! I mean, there's no overlap. <laughs> In 2014, Nakamura, Akazaki, and Amano were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for creating the blue LED. He has published over 900 papers. Wow. Throughout his entire journey, one thing has never changed. What is your favorite color? Oh, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> was it always blue or only after you made the LED? I was born the fishery village, fishery village, in front of the house. Is there. Awesome. Group already. This was probably my favorite Veritasium video thus far. I love these kinds of stories. I'm glad he's still doing well today. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.